Greetings to you. My name is Tara Brabazon and I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University. And my goodness me, have I got a series of vlogs for you. Yes, you. I have nicknamed these the Social Justice Quartet. So let me tell you how we got here. Firstly, I received a request from Deb. Hi Deb, you are a legend. And she asked me to do a vlog on social justice methodologies. Very challenging, very interesting. So just as I was starting the research on that particular vlog, an email popped in. And I think this email, it came from, by the way, one of our students in Darwin. And she'd just been watching, I think, the What's Your Story vlog. And she told me something quite challenging about her own life. She said she was in a bit of a difficult place because she started her PhD in Adelaide and then she went with her partner up to Darwin so he could find a great job and continued her PhD part time and they are about to marry. But she expressed to me a great worry and it was very, very moving. She asked whether the person that started that PhD was actually being lost. And she used the great phrase that always horrifies me. She asked me, can women have it all? And asked if I would do a vlog on that. Now, wow, that one's going to be challenging. Again, I've got research on the floor of my office at home that I'm looking on that. And I am going to try and do a vlog on the PhD, women, and having it all. We'll see how I go. And, of course, then the saga continues, because on the same day that wonderful lass from Darwin sent me a message, I got a message from John, an email from John. Uh, he is a PhD student who is also gay. And by the conclusion of the vlog, he was asking if I would do a video on the nature of being a gay PhD student in a heteronormative university. I was simply in tears at the end of the email. It was so incredibly moving. And John, this one is for you. You're amazing. So I'm going to write that up for you and I hope it does justice to your courage in sending me that email. Okay, now that's all going incredibly well. But in the week, the working week, after I'd received that email from John and that wonderful lass in Darwin, Something bonkers happened in this office, something remarkable, something stunning. It had never happened before and it will probably never happen again. But four remarkable young men, three from the harder end of the lab-based sciences and one gentleman from empirical social science, individually saw me. Now, they don't know each other, I don't think, they're in very disparate disciplines, but they all came to see me during a five-day period. And each of them is within six to eight months of finishing their PhD, so it's a really sweet and interesting spot of your candidature. And each of them came to me asking and wanting to get information about how to step off the treadmill of the PhD. So how to get out of what they described as the sausage factory of the post PhD life. They didn't want to be part of a university anymore. The long hours, the casual work, the fitting in and just hoping a space might be made for them in the future university system. Two of them still liked research and discovery, but had no interest in continuing their lives in lab-based environments. One gentleman still enjoyed teaching and still liked writing. And one of them, remarkably courageous young man, simply wanted a break from everything. He said, look, I'm going to finish this PhD and then I'm never going to step into a university ever again. I'm done. I've had it. Now, all these remarkable young men expressed great love for their partners and they said, you know what? I want a life. I want a social life. I want leisure. I want to exercise. I want to enjoy myself and I want to spend time with the woman that I care for. Fascinating. And each of them said to me in different ways, and one of them actually used this quote, and I wrote it down on my iPad, the way universities are set up, it's just not for me, end of quote. So this was absolutely remarkable. So what we did with these young gentlemen is we talked through different trajectories and different pathways that can exist as you leave a PhD program that is much more than these cycles of temporary work or casual work and broken relationships. They simply, and how telling is this, they didn't like the type of academics, 
researchers and supervisors, the men they were seeing in universities, they didn't like what they were seeing. And instead of seeing their mentors about different ways of being a man, they made a decision to see a five foot two, 40 something woman to talk about what maybe their future might hold. How interesting is that? So all four of these inspira inspirational young men asked if I would do a vlog about men in universities, different ways of leaving a PhD program, and indeed something about what is happening to our men in universities. So for me, part of this is very bittersweet, part of this is a tragedy. So the best and brightest of our universities, our fantastic young men are going, I'm done, I'm out of a university, I don't like what I'm seeing, I'm out. So at the end of this vlog, as always, there's a bit of an advocate element to it. I will have a bit of a stroppy ending to this, so if you'd like to hang with me, let's do this. And what I want to say to you, every single one of you watching this vlog, but also particularly for the young men who are watching this vlog around the world, what I want to say to you is you are spectacular, you are special, you are important, and you deserve to find your own way your own trajectory, your own pathway through masculinity, through learning, through education, and yes, through our universities. What we have now is not sustainable. We need a different way of doing universities. And that will start with you, whether you're male or female, straight or gay, or somewhere in between these binary poles. And what I want for all of us is all of us together create the best workplace that we can, that isn't some, simply some sort of leftover of Mad Men or a version of Game of Thrones. So these incidents all happened to me within basically a week. So I decided I'd combine them all into a social justice quartet. And again, I would never consider writing any of these topics. It's down to you and I thank you for everything that you do. But as a statement and a thank you for those courageous men who came into my office to talk about different futures for themselves and for others. Let's start with men, masculinity, and the PhD. And of course, there is a fine literature on men and masculinity studies. I've worked in men and masculinity studies for just over 20 years. And there's also some very important work on men, women, leadership in higher education. So that's the literature I'm using and framing today's discussion. So boom, let's do this. Right, now we white folks very rarely think about the pervasive impact of our whiteness on the black populations that we see and meet. We don't think about this face and the impact of moving through life with this face on other people. And similarly, and really not surprisingly, it's very hard for men to think through and understand the pervasive impact of masculinity on women. So just to give you a personal example here, yes, the shoes are here for a reason. Uh, as many of you know, I had my first couple of degrees at the University of Western Australia in Perth, and I used to be one of those terrible people. Remember, I was an historian, so I used to arrive at the library before it would open every morning, and I would leave when it closed every night. So every night I would be walking back to my car, and of course, some of you that know the UWA car parks, they're pretty dispersed from the library. So one night I remember leaving the library and I could hear, because it's cobblestone, and I could hear the click, click, click of my heels moving as I walked to my car park. And that was great, so I could hear myself click, 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 walking along the cobblestone. The problem was behind me, there was a gentleman's footsteps, the clomp, 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 clomp that I was hearing, and his footsteps were faster than mine and my heart started to move pump 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 and I was frightened. Now this guy was probably an absolutely delightful fella. He had absolutely no understanding of the impact of his footsteps on a woman and that's really the point that I'm making today. Let's throw the shoes away. Okay, so he was a delightful guy but you might like to think about all the reasons that exist in our culture why a fit young woman would be frightened of a man's footsteps. Okay, so what is the nature of this power that straight men hold? Well, their first power 
is the capacity to silence alternative stories. They enact both an active and a passive subordination of women and gay men in the workplace, in leisure environments, within families. And of course there is also the sexual oppressions that are activated during colonisation and the female populations of those colonies. The imperial masculinity was a particularly and is a particularly destructive one. So all these inequalities are made possible by ignoring the power that men hold. So these remarkable young men that talked to me didn't wish to evade the power that they held. In fact, they wanted to give it away and find a different way of living. Now Rutherford agrees with them. Rutherford argues, that, and quite productively I think, that our whole culture is based on not thinking about men not thinking about masculinity, and instead of actually dealing with and exploring the nature of being a man, we displace all those discussions onto women. It's about women over there, or it's about the gay community, or it's about the black community. So everything is displaced onto other people, never actually looking at men and masculinity. So masculine heterosexuality is based on the strength of structures and institutions and organisations. And when those structures and organisations weaken, so does masculinity. So what are those structures? What are those institutions? Well, the introduction of new technology, the de-skilling of male jobs, high levels of male unemployment, the growing sector and grouping of employed part-time women, with the resultant transformations of the private sphere and family life, but also the exposure of child abuse and men's violence against their partners and wives, and obviously in the last couple of years, the extraordinary growth of the Me Too movement. Now, this is important. None of these are individual issues or problems. I'm not blaming or talking about individuals here at all. I am talking today about structures, and about ideologies. So actually what I'm stating, I'm going to put it out there and you may disagree with me and that's cool, but violent men are not non-conformists. They're not deviants. Violent men are over-conformists, over-responding to a particular element of male socialization. You know that great cliche, boys will be boys? What does that even mean? And that's the point of what we're talking about today. You see, a successful male performance is active, dominating, reasonable, sexually potent with women, oh yes, and of course literate or competent in public sphere activities. But a successful male performance is not, and this is perhaps even more important, passive, supportive, emotional or competent in private sphere activities. And that's why those four young men came to see me actually, because they found the mode of masculinity that's presented in academic life in and out of a PhD program simply not compatible with what they wanted from their life and personal relationships. They didn't want to, and two of them actually expressed it as overtly as this, they did not want to work 100 hours a week for 40 years and then die. <laughs> with stress and anxiety, they wanted a different way of doing life and good on them for that. They wanted something else, but the problem that we all have is there are very few models of what that something else might actually be. The socialization of the heterosexual young male scientist is very, very tight, very, very small, and there is a clear narrative in place for those young men. And the way these guys were negotiating that, so they went, I'm out, I'm out of a university, there's not enough alternatives here, this is not the life I want to live. Now, how incredible is this? And can I say also, it's probably wrong, because the ideal man, the ideal researcher, the ideal scientist, trust me, is not remotely real. <laughs> if it helps you, masculinity doesn't sort itself out 
against femininity. We have all that cliche, men and women, right? Masculinity doesn't actually sort itself out against femininity. Masculinity sorts itself out in relation to other masculinities. So in other words, men configure their identity in relation to what they're seeing with other men. So the reason why that men are exposed to a lack of diversity of successful masculinities beyond the heterosexual, procreative, white man in a full-time job is because men are what we refer to in linguistics and social science as the unmarked sign. Unmarked sign. So let me explain to you what this means, okay? Our language, the words we use, our language and our culture is based on marking that which is distinctive or odd or different. So that, for example, is why we have to put the word female in front of engineer. Because when you say the word engineer, the assumption is that that person is, thanks for playing, male. So the only way you can actually change what that word is, is add a word to it, to mark engineer by saying a female engineer. So women in STEM is an important phrase, but we have to mark STEM because it's assumed that STEM is male. You're with me. So that's why we also talk about women in leadership because leadership, good stuff. So our culture therefore marks the different, the marginal, but also yes, the inferior. That's what the marking does. And that works on men as well. So we assume, for example, the person who works at a home is a housewife. But we have to mark that person who is competent in private sphere activities as male because it's so unusual. So that's where you end up with that weird phrase, house husband. And think about the connotations that come along with house husband. So when a word or a category is unmarked, engineer, Right? When it's unmarked, that is dominant and that is powerful. And in fact, it's so dominant and powerful, we don't have to think about it too much. Yeah. So when I say man, we don't need much else because we all supposedly know what a man is and what a man does. So this is the unmarked sign or the unmarked category. And by the way, it's also referred to as unaffixed, unaffixed masculinity. And that's where is bucket time. Okay, so what I'm arguing today is men and masculinity is a big bucket. So we all think we know what's going on in the bucket, but what we do know is what is in the bucket is really powerful, but we don't actually know necessarily what's in it. And that requires to really have a sense of the magic of the bucket. That requires us to have a, a very strong sense of marking all these other groups, like women, like the gay community, like bi, transgender, queer affiliated, non-procreative men. Oh, what's going on there? Uh, men in part-time work, men with caring responsibilities. So basically, the bulk of the population outside of the bucket. So this marking and unmarking also configures organizational and institutional expectations, okay? So universities were male-only organizations. Just to give you the clearest example of this, women were only able to gain a degree from Cambridge University in 1947. So that's only a couple of generations ago. Women couldn't even get a degree from Cambridge, okay? And if you read John Henry Newman's The Idea of the University, you'll see there's not a single woman mentioned in the entire book, The Idea of the University. So it is the story of young, brilliant white men who get together and talk with other young, white, brilliant men about higher thoughts. So these guys get together and do knowledge. And then once they leave a university, they go on to manage their estates, become captains of industry, enter the clergy, or indeed run the empire. Bless. So our universities, as you can see, have a history and heritage of being a male-only space. That's what they are. Blokes got together and they did knowledge. Now that means to this day, the structures that exist in a university are geared for young, single men. 
And when those young single men enter the workplace, they then marry and the women take care of the private sphere and the men go on to success in the public sphere. So as you can see, this unmarked sign stuff is quite tough on the rest of us. But the point I'm making today is this unmarked sign stuff is actually really tough on men. In universities, there's incredible structure and momentum for young men to become academics. And it has, to be frank, a huge amount of similarity with Newman's time. Now, this is not remotely real or rational or the experience of the majority of people that exist in our university, but the bucket remains. Remember, the average PhD student at Flinders University is about 36 years of age. And our gender split is pretty good between male and female. But the assumption to this day of our PhD programs is all our students are young, single men working in a lab. And then those young single men that have worked in a lab graduate from their PhD and then they're prepared to go anywhere in the world tomorrow for a short-term contract that doesn't provide a lot of money and they'll keep doing the short-term contracts without a lot of money until they might accidentally land on a tenured or tenurable post. So that's the narrative. And you know what? That narrative is true for a minority of 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 our students. But this unmarked sign category and stuff still continues to perpetuate this narrative that this is what's going to happen to you. It won't. And think about it, if our best and brightest men and women are not getting an opportunity to find a place for themselves, a different way of living, then they're going to do what those four young men are doing. They're going to go, thanks for playing, I'm out team. And there is no doubt, there is no doubt, masculinity is changing. But many of the models of masculinity that exist in our universities are lagged. So this means straight, white, procreative men, married men, are in leadership roles in our universities, not only in Australia, but around the world. And that's what we're seeing as a successful man. But changes are coming. It's coming to the workplace and it's coming to family life. Now during the 1930s, moving the bucket, during the 1930s masculinity was defined through work, promotion, respectability. Working class men were directed towards hard physical labour to attain those goals. Middle class masculinity revolved around white collar achievement. So it was from this depression period, ironically, that the cliche, a man's right to work, emerged. So think about that phrase, a man's right to work. A man has a right to be submissive to the daily routines of work, to ignore social alternatives, to neglect his or her family. So men's experience, therefore, in life, from certainly the 1930s, but really through the Industrial Revolution, was very, very contradictory because they are in a subservient position in the workplace, but a dominant position in the home. And that paradox has a lot of consequences on masculinity. Particularly through the Second World War, women's employment prospects opened up widely. But can I say what people forget about that story is, of course, those women then returned to the home at the conclusion of the Second World War. But by the 60s, those women were back in the workforce, gaining increasing economic independence and also increasing expectations of men's behaviour because the breadwinner role was now over. And then no-fault divorce arrived at the end of the 1960s, early 1970s, through much of the world. So this meant a woman, for the first time really, had a right to walk out of a dysfunctional relationship. So therefore, an ideological shift was in place for women team, moving from self-sacrifice, so I will sacrifice my life for my family, to a sense of entitlement. So women saying, you know what, I actually do have a right to a bit of happiness. Yeah. So besides the changes in the workforce, family structures are also changing. Not only the patterns of fertility and contraception, obviously the more educated a woman, the fewer children she has, the best contraceptive in the world is a university degree, but also how families operate on a daily basis. So acknowledging men who are gay affirmative, anti-sexist and pro-feminist is one way for men to just think about 
who they are and what's existing in the world. It's a great reflexive mechanism for men. And of course, all men are not powerful. Class intervenes very strongly in the conception of masculinity. A few men hold a lot of power and they serve to exploit not only women and children, but also, you've guessed it, other men. So we are seeing incredibly high rates, particularly in Australia, can I say, of male suicide, anxiety, stress. Also some research I'm looking at at the moment is the self-medication of men and masculinity through alcohol and drugs. So clearly men are suffering from the bucket effect as well. Men are suffering from this unmarking. Heteronormative masculinity is pretty dangerous at the moment. It's threatened, it's challenged, it's disrupted and it's provoked. And the problem with brittle heteronormative masculinity is that it shatters and the shards can kill people. So men have choices to make. The advantage of being in power or holding some power is that actually you can make different choices. And there are incredible benefits in finding alternative pathways through masculinity. But the, the last bit of this vlog today is really a warning because you're gonna to have to hold your nerve. For the men out there, I'm looking at you. You're gonna to have to hold your nerve, you're gonna to have to be courageous, and you're gonna to have to show some gumption. And I'll tell you why. Because there are costs in creating alternative masculinities. There are costs of creating different ways of being a man. And I thought I'd finish off with just a couple examples from my late wonderful husband, Professor Steve Redhead, that may just inspire you to make a difference. So when I met Steve, Professor Steve Redhead, when I met Steve, he was already a professor. He, he was world famous, he had changed a whole series of disciplines, he built a whole series of other disciplines. And he argued throughout his life, from when he was a very young man, in his teen years actually, and he used to use this phrase, Men's behaviour must be patrolled by feminists and feminism. And he used the word patrol, he used to freak people out, it's like, I'm sorry, men will misbehave. We need to be organised by feminism. We need to be patrolled. Let feminism control us. And he used to say this, he used to get people going in a quite an interesting way. But he made a decision to occupy a different type of masculinity. And that was transformative for thousands of scholars around the world. He supervised the first transgender PhD student in the world, and he used his credibility as a straight white man to create space and protection for that student. He supervised more women than men through PhD supervision, but I always think his greatest role was the support he gave to thousands of men in universities around the world. Gave them courage to be a different type of man. And those men are now professors and heads of department and indeed even vice chancellors around the world. Now he'd done all of this heavily influenced by feminism before we even met. He was this posh professor and I was just a humble senior lecturer. I'd just published my second book and he made a decision to support me and to support my career, career. And he used to say to me, quote, I've made so many mistakes, let me use my mistakes to help your career, end of quote. So he put his money where his mouth was. He left a British chair, he left a professorship that he'd held for 30 years to move to Australia and help me in my career. And of course he realised very quickly when he moved to Australia that it was a profoundly sexist place and actually I probably wouldn't be a professor here. So he said, right, we're out of here. Uh, you're going to get a professorship in the United Kingdom. So yes, I applied for a British chair and I got one. And still to this day, you know, if I hadn't gone overseas and gained that professorship and that chair and all that experience and profile, I wonder if I would ever have been promoted to a professor in Australia. Interesting issue. So we left because he said, there's nothing going on here. We'll have to leave to get you the career that you deserve, and we did. And we left Australia, it was brilliant, it was weird, it was extraordinary, it was strange, but hell, we had a good time. And then he said, right, time to come back. So we then returned to Australia, and I, again, had a leadership role in an Australian university. But the funny thing about returning to Australia this time is it was Steve that was treated really badly by other men. Now, there are many reasons for that. Part of it was certainly intellectual jealousy, yeah, for sure. But increasingly, and this was the brilliantly fabulous 
a proxy for the state of Australian higher education really, increasingly people didn't know who he was because Australian academics were doing very little reading. And of course that was either intentional or not, but again the nature of Australian universities sadly at the moment and the reason why we're tumbling down the rankings is because we're occupying ourselves in local mode. So we're terribly interested in what's happening in Adelaide or Melbourne or Darwin and not actually what's happening in the rest of the world. And you know I want every single one of you to commit to the planet. Stop working in local mode. You are an international scholar. Lift. Come on. Bring it. Okay. So it was really funny, particularly when we moved to Adelaide and to Flinders, because it was other male academics, straight white male academics, who were saying to me, and I heard it so often that actually it became sort of a mantra, oh I believe your partner Tara is publishing a new book. And that would have been said to me 15, 20 times when Theoretical Times was coming out. Now what was interesting is, you notice Steve Redhead didn't have a name. He was my partner. So he was becoming a marked sign. So male academics disrespected Steve because his wife was a senior academic and what sort of man would accept a secondary role to his wife? How amazing is this? So if someone, this is the lesson for you all, if someone as senior and famous as Steve Redhead is undermined by other Australian straight men, then what is going to happen to the rest of you? And that's what we have to work through. Now, can I say, Steve just laughed at all of this. He, he just laughed like a, like a banshee, actually. He laughed and laughed and laughed, and he used the old Tony Wilson line when people would be saying, oh, I believe you're Tara's partner, or oh, I believe you've got a new book coming out. He would say, if you get it, fine. If you don't, that's okay. But maybe you should read more. <laughs> Bless him. So Steve, of course, he was a big man, 6'2", 15 stone, big guy, one of the brightest people on the planet, and he had a great sense of himself, of his strength, who he was as an intellectual, who he was as a scholar, and therefore he focused from that position of power to the feminist task of doing what he believed was the most important work in Australia at the moment, and that was ensuring that the standards in a doctoral program are maintained. We took this job because we did not want to dumb down Australian universities anymore. We had to stand for something, and we made a decision to come here and ensure that a PhD remains at international standard. And he did everything he could to support that. So needless to say, upon his death, the international response to Steve's death created a fair amount of confusion amongst male Flinders academics. And they sort of were coming up to me and saying crazy stuff like, oh, I didn't realise he was as well known as that. Oh, I didn't know he was quite as famous or as important as that. Bless. To which I, of course, replied the Tony Wilson line, if you get it, fine. If you don't, it's okay. But maybe you should read more. Boom. So, for all the great men in our PhD program at Flinders, but all the great men around the world in PhD programs, this is what I want for you. I want you to have choices, have a sense of who you are and what is important to you. Don't live the narratives that other people have written for you. Do not do that. Do not live the expectations of other people. One man, one courageous, brilliant man like you can occupy a different space and can change our universities. Men have power, yes, but you know what? You can use it in different ways. Our universities can change and yes, they will change. Many of us, as we move around the world, will see those changes. So casual work will become common, contract work will become common, we know all of that. But that also creates spaces for different ways of living. And also, can I say, different ways of being a man. What I would say to you is you are an amazing scholar. You are an amazing man. And we will all gain with you finding alternative pathways through knowledge, through universities, and through masculinity. I wish you love, light, and peace.
TM.